Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein. Welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's monthly Meet the Scientist webinar series. I'm pleased to have you join us. Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself and our foundation. Um, I am pleased to say that I joined the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation last November. I'm a psychiatrist, and I am on the voluntary faculty at Columbia. In addition to my work with the foundation, I serve as the host of the public television program Healthy Minds, which is broadcast across the nation. The foundation website has a listing of local stations airing Healthy Minds. Um, today's webinar is the first installment in our series for 2013. We're holding the webinars on the second Tuesday of every month at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. As you know, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is dedicated to funding research by providing NARSTAD grants to scientists around the world. The foundation has awarded close to $300 million in grants over 25 years. Grants are selected by our scientific council, which is led by Dr. Herb Pardis and includes 138 preeminent mental health researchers, including two Nobel laureates, all of whom volunteer their time to select the best science to fund. I am extremely pleased to introduce today's speaker, who is a great friend of the foundation, Dr. Myrna Weissman, who joins us from Columbia University and will speak on depression in families. As the recipient of the NARSAD Distinguished Investigator Grants in 1991, 2000, and 2005, Dr. Weissman fully understands the power of our NARSAD grants. The foundation has been privileged to award Dr. Weissman the 1994 Outstanding Achievement Award in Mood Disorders Research. I'm equally proud to share that many of us also know Dr. Weissman from her generous act of establishing the Clareman Award for clinical research by a NARSAD young investigator. The Clareman Award is named for her late husband, Dr. Gerald Clareman, a distinguished researcher and clinician. Dr. Weissman is a professor of epidemiology and psychiatry at Columbia and is recognized throughout the psychiatric community for her groundbreaking 25-year, three-generation study of depression and is particularly interested in the impact of stress upon those who are already susceptible to becoming depressed. Before we begin, I want to let you know that this is an interactive event. We'll begin with Dr. Weissman's formal presentation and follow with a question and answer period. All the people in the audience could submit their questions online, and I will, as best as possible, select those um, questions um, and hopefully be able to get to as many of them as possible um, during the latter part of the webinar. Now, without further ado, I'm pleased to present my colleague, Dr. Myrna Weissman. Hello. Well, I am really pleased to be able to participate in my first webinar of any kind. I'm especially grateful to brain and behavior, because some of the research you're going to hear about today would not have been able to continue for 25 years if not for help along the way by NARSAD grant. It was uh, useful to us in showing to the NIMH that we could get the people to come back and participate. And most recently, it's been useful in our getting um, genetic samples from these families when, again, it was not clear that we would be funded. Uh, this convinced the reviewers at National Institutes of Mental Health to fund us, and we're now going well. And we're, we're actually in our sixth wave, and we're doing the 30-year follow-up. So I am a very, very grateful person to NARSAD and brain and behavior. I'm going to tell you, um, give you glimpses of this research, and I want to leave enough time to have as many questions as possible because I like the interaction, and I'd like to know what the viewers are thinking. Now, this is uh, this 
slide shows a, a, an article that appeared in the New York Times this summer by Daphne Merkin. And uh, she's somebody who's written about her own depression and depression in families. And she raised the question that everybody who is depressed has. Is it inherited? And fortunately, she came to the conclusion, well, maybe it is, but not my, my daughter doesn't have it, nor is it inevitable. And I'm going to talk about depression in families uh, and how it can be prevented and avoided through mother's good treatment. And I'll also tell you about uh, some of the new personalized treatment for depression that we're trying to uh, to test out here at Columbia and three other sites in the United States. Now, this is a study. It began by our selecting. It's actually a study that began uh, not, at, not long after I finished graduate school at Yale. And I was very interested. At that time, I had very small children. And I was very interested in what it must be like for a family and for children to have a depressed parent. So we took depressed parents who were coming to a treatment clinic for the treatment of depression, at that time using uh, medication. And we interviewed them and studied all of their children. That was the second generation. And then as the years got, went on, the children got married. And we studied their spouse. And then we studied their children. So we had essentially three generations. Generation one is now the grandparents. Generation two are the children or the offspring. And generation three are the grandchildren. And in this 30-year follow-up, we are actually we found 66 uh, fourth generation great-grandchildren. Well, as an epidemiologist, we have to say, compared to what? How are these offspring and grandchildren doing in terms of their functioning and their psychiatric disorders compared to people and families where there isn't depression? So we did the same type of research, identifying a first generation who never had any psychiatric disorders and their spouse. And we did the identical study in the, from the first generation to the second generation, third generation. And again, we have a few fourth generations. And we used uh, clinically trained interviewers who interviewed family members but never knew whether this person came from a high risk or from a low-risk family. I won't go through all the findings. They've been published. And if anyone is interested, if they send me an email, we'll, we'll send you some of the papers. But this is essentially what we found, that if there is no depression, this is the low-risk families, as compared to the high-risk, there were higher rates of depression in the offspring and also in the grandchildren of the high-risk generation one. You can see that the onset of depression, and this is the age of onset, is similar in the low and the high risk. The first onsets of depression are usually between the ages of about 15 to 25. But that the peak and the magnitude is much greater in the offspring of the high risk. And this was a finding that we, uh, we thought was uh, very important when we looked across three generations. We looked at the grandparents who were at low risk, that's these bars, and the grandparents who were at high risk. And then we looked at their children, they were the parents, who didn't have depression, had depression, who didn't have depression, and had depression. Because even high-risk people, not everybody gets depressed. And we looked at the grandchildren. And this was somewhat of a shocker, that over 40% of the grandchildren who came from families where there were two previous generations affected, by the age of 12 themselves, had some type of a mood disorder. So we felt we were into something that was very important and where we should start thinking about preventive intervention. Now these uh, just show what some of the findings, they summarize them. There was a two to six fold increased risk of depression in the high risk families as compared to the low. And the difference depends on whether we define it as 
uh, ordinary mood disorders, or very, very serious depression. Anxiety was the first presentation in childhood. And in the high-risk families, we would see early onset anxiety disorders, prepubertal, in the high-risk children. And then around puberty, it would emerge into a depression. And as we followed them, we found substance abuse increase in the adult offspring of the high-risk families as compared to the low. The 40% of grandchildren, that's what I showed you before, with a depressed parent and grandparent had some mood disorder by adolescence. And this was another surprising finding, that the parents, that's the second generation, who are now in their 50s, had an increased risk of cardiovascular problems. They had been to a doctor and had been diagnosed with having some type of a cardiovascular problem, and they were in their mid to early 50s. Well, numerous studies show that the children of depressed mothers have more psychiatric disorders than children of non-depressed mothers, and there are many others now who have done these studies since we have. We don't know what happens to the children when their mother's depression remits. And can the children benefit from a remission from a remission themselves if the mothers are asymptomatic. Now, we did a number of other studies, which I have gone into here. We're trying to understand the mechanism. What are some of the biological mechanisms which may lead some families to be at high and some at low risk for depression? And we've been looking at brain imaging, doing structural and functional imaging studies. And where we do find something called cortical thickness, a reduction of cortical thickness that runs through the families of the high-risk uh, cohorts. And it occurs regardless of whether the offspring or the grandchildren became depressed. And now through the courtesy of NARSED, which we began our ability to collect samples, and now also being funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health, we are collecting DNA, and we're going to see if there are some genetic markers which may explain why some families are at risk and others aren't. But we wanted to do something besides just write papers and study this and understand the mechanisms. Uh, I have a history of working in treatment studies. And I thought we ought to try to do some intervention, whether we could avert the depression in the high-risk offspring and grandchildren and develop some ideas of prevention. <clears throat> now, we argued depression is a complex genetic disorder. The, but the onset and the reoccurrence is precipitated by stress in vulnerable individuals. Uh, for example, it's, it's probably a little bit like adult onset diabetes. Uh, if you have a genetic predisposition to diabetes, but if you eat well and exercise and don't get overweight, you may never have an onset, or you could delay your onset until you're quite a bit older. However, if you are not prudent in your diet and your exercise, you may have what's happening, what we see here around the hospital, which is an epidemic of adult onset diabetes occurring in adolescence. So we think depression is like that, and that uh, we, if we can find ways of reducing the precipitance of stress in, the, in vulnerable persons, we might be able to have some success. Now, what could be more stressful to a child than having a depressed parent? And we wonder, do the children benefit if we can modify that, if there's a remission in their parent's depression? So we set out to design a study that would treat the parents and follow the children. And that's what we did. There was a study going on in 14 sites in the United States called the STAR-D. And this study was set up to mimic clinical practice so that um, the physicians who were treating depression would be able to uh, find out how to get the patient into remission. And they would try first one treatment, one medication. If that didn't work after 12 weeks, which is about the time uh, of a reasonable uh, 
test of, of a medication. Then they would go to another treatment, and it was a very uh, complex design and, uh, and very controlled. Well, this seemed like an ideal way of testing out our hypothesis that if mom got better, kids got better. So the mothers were treated for their depression. That's in, there were 14 sites. We only did seven. And the mother's outcome was followed by a completely different team. We were not part of the mother's treatment team. But we assessed the children. And we followed their children, ages 7 to 17, who were living, they had to be living with the mother uh, at least 50% or more of the time. We followed them over time, and we saw how the child, children did. And we assessed the children by clinicians who were not providing the mother's treatment and didn't know how the mothers were doing. So as I've just to summarized, the mothers were receiving treatment as uh, participants in the STAR-D, that sequent treatment alternative to the release of depression. And the purpose was to understand what to do next if the first treatment doesn't produce a remission in the mother. Our goal, just to summarize, was to study the impact of improvement in the mother's depression on the children's psychiatric diagnosis symptoms and functioning. We recruited mothers with current depression, treated the maternal depression, and assessed the children before the mothers are treated and followed them up for a year after the mothers were treated and had a remission. Now, <clears throat> some of you who are listening are wondering, well, why did we not do fathers? We would have loved to have studied fathers, but what we found is that fathers do not bring their children in for these type of studies. And also, male depression is less common than female depression, and it is, um, which is far few fathers. Uh, men have lower rates of depression, and men have far lower rates of treatment for depression. They usually don't come for treatment until they have other types of, types of problems. Now, when the mothers came for treatment, we found what we sort of expected when we were studying the high-risk children, that a third of the children were currently ill with some psychiatric disorder, usually a mood disorder, and a half of them had a lifetime history of psychiatric disorders. So we were on the right target, that this was a high-risk group, children of mothers who were coming for treatment. So we looked at three months after the initiation of mother's treatment. A third of the mothers remitted. That meant that they were asymptomatic on our measures of uh, depressive symptoms. The Hamilton score is the one that's used. Not a very high rate of, of remission. But 49% were responders. That meant that they had at least a 50% reduction in their symptoms, although they may still have had symptoms. And we looked at the change in the child's diagnosis by whether or not the mother remitted. First, we found if a mother remitted, there was 11% overall decrease in the number of diagnoses the children had. But if she didn't remit, there was actually an 8% increase. That shows it. So this is when mothers came in for treatment. And you can see the mothers who remitted and the mothers who didn't remit had the same rates of diagnoses in their children. And three months later, the mother remitted. The children had fewer diagnoses. If the mother didn't, the children had more. <clears throat> we also looked at just excluding children who didn't have a diagnosis. Uh, and looked at those who had a diagnosis at baseline. Remember, about a third of them had some diagnosis at baseline. And we found that if, if children had a diagnosis at baseline, if the mother remitted, a third of them got better. And if she didn't remit, only 12% got better. But this is the important one. For children without a diagnosis at baseline, if the mother remitted, all the children remained well. 
but if a mother did not remit, 17% of her children developed a diagnosis. That tells us something about prevention. The Wall Street Journal loved this article. And they ran, run, they ran this, uh, this, this article themselves when we uh, published the paper called Helping Kids Beat Depression by Treating Mom. And it says, successfully treating a mother with depression isn't just good for mom, it also can provide long-lasting benefits for her children. And in fact, when, I, when my children saw this uh, article, they wrote, they made a t-shirt for me that said, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Well, but how lasting is the child's remission? And that, that was of great interest to us. And we looked at that, and we found that if the mother had an early remission, there was a significant number of kids who remained asymptomatic, who had a reduction in their scores over the following year. If she was a late remitter, that is, after the first three months, there was still a significant number that remained without symptoms over the following year. But if she didn't remit, then the children did not have a recovery. So this is one year after the mother's remission. And uh, that was important to know that whatever had gone on there had been sustained. So to summarize, an overall decrease in the child's symptoms over the course of a 12-month follow-up was shown. Child's improvement significantly was associated with mother's remission. Children of mothers who remitted had a greater reduction in their own psychiatric symptoms. And children who, of mothers who remitted in the first three to six months, the early remitters, had the most positive outcomes. So the message there is, if a mother is depressed, get good treatment, get treatment early, and stick with it until you can achieve remission. Well, I showed you in the beginning that only about a third of, of the women in the study actually had a remission in the first uh, three months. And overall, it was about 70% over the course of the whole study. And one of the things we know, and any of you in the audience who have been treated for depression or who have family members who have been treated, you know that uh, there's often a lot of playing around until you can find the right treatment, whether it's drugs or psychotherapy. Antidepressants or psychotherapy are, on the average, more effective than placebos or no treatment. But individual response to specific treatment varies widely. For example, as I've mentioned, STAR-D found that only half of the patients went into remission after three months of treatment, and only 50 to 60 percent were in remission after a year of varying the treatments. And it's very hard for a clinician to predict which evidence-based treatment will work for any given individual. Doctors have their beliefs and they have their experience, but it is very difficult to make that prediction. Well, there is a new wave called personalized treatment. And it's delivery of health care tailored to a unique individual based on their characteristics rather than information about work, what works for a group of individuals. So we are part of a study. It's called EMBARC to develop a panel of tests that together create a unique biosignature that can predict response. And what we hope is to reduce the hit or miss choice of evidence-based treatment. This is the study. It's called Embark Establishing Moderators and Biosignatures of Response in Clinical Care. The study is being conducted at four centers. New York, this is the Columbia University number, and I think they'll leave this up so that if anyone is interested. In Boston, it's the Mass General Hospital. Dallas, Texas, it's Southwestern University. And in Detroit, it's the University of Michigan. So the answer to the question that Daphne Merkin posed is, is depression inherited? 
The answer is likely yes. But does that mean it's inevitable? The answer is most likely no. And we have some ideas about how to prevent remission, how to prevent a relapse and onset of symptoms in the offspring of depressed fathers. And we are working on how to get better treatments that are more personalized to the individual. This research has been supported over the years by a lot of different people. The National Institutes of Mental Health, the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, and the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, NARSAD, which stepped in and helped us to continue when we might have lost this large cohort of family members who have been loyal to us and who have come back every year that we have called them. That's now six times and who live now all over the United States, but do come for assessments and to check in. So I thank you very, very much, and I'm very happy to have questions. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Weissman. Thank you so much for an outstanding, outstanding presentation. Um, the, it, we now have the opportunity, really, to have um, a conversation, um, and I'm going to incorporate questions um, that have come to us um, over the internet, um, and um, and have that as a springboard for you to provide even more information um, to our audience. Okay. Uh, the uh, the first question um, it relates to um, the type of treatment. Um, for children, if they do have a depression, um, is there any information based upon what treatment worked for the mother uh, to help what treatment would work for the child? That's a very good question. Um, if it works for mom, will it work for the kid? And uh, I don't think that's ever been, uh, been studied. I'm sure that clinicians have their opinion and their experience in it. The treatment studies uh, for depressed children uh, have begun to emerge over the last five years. And uh, there's some evidence that there are uh, the usual medications that have worked for adults work for children, of course, in smaller doses. And that uh, there are some of the psychotherapies that have been developed for adults that are evidence-based that work for children and adolescents. Now, I should differentiate between children and adolescents. The treatment of depressed children, that's the prepubertal depression, is the, the data there are, um, are sparser. Also, depression usually doesn't occur uh, in the prepubertal ages. It, you see the beginning of it in adolescence. And we're, I think, on much murkier ground with prepubes. OK. Let, let me ask um, a, a topic that's very, very important which is the, the issue of suicide prevention, um, in particular in people with depression. Um, what, what type of information have your studies, either the ones you've discussed so far or other studies you've had, brought to light in terms of um, suicide risk in, um, in the children of, uh, of mothers who have depression? Well, the suicide risk is greater if a child or adolescent has depression. There's no question about that. And is that greater than the general population? I'm sure it is. Uh, we have been lucky and have not found, there's been many um, expressions of suicidal ideation, feeling life is not worth living and wishing one was dead. But the actual rates of suicide attempts and fortunately, no suicide completes that I know of uh, have occurred in this family. But in general, I would say that where there's depression, there is more risk. If there's depression and anxiety disorders, there's more risk. If there's depression and substance abuse, there's more risk. OK. And what should, if um, a, a, a person has depression and gets treatment, and they're concerned about their child, whether it be a younger child or even a young adult child, 
what should they do to help minimize the risk that they're above and beyond getting treatment for themselves? Um, what should they do to minimize the risk that their child um, would ultimately get a depression? Well, I think if they could keep themselves asymptomatic, that's, that would seem to be one of the big things they can do. And if they can uh, deal with some of the early signs, and those would be, if in pre would be phobias, the, the phobias and the anxiety disorders. And there are some good treatments for that, that, uh, you know, that are mostly psychological treatments. So, so if somebody, if a, if a child is showing some of those um, type of symptoms, um, the anxiety, et cetera, that, that would be something that would, would be of concern in terms of treating that would potentially reduce the risk of them ultimately developing a depression. Well, that's the one study we wanted to do and haven't done, which is that if we could treat early anxiety, could we prevent subsequent, subsequent depression? And that's a hard study to do because you'd have to follow children over uh, many years, you know, from, from pre pubes through adolescence. Right. And nobody, I think, has done that study. So we're basing this on clinical observations. But the, the early signs of a possible depression in adolescence in a high-risk child is phobias. Okay. Not panic, but anxiety disorders and social phobias and specific phobias. So if, some, if, if a parent sees this in their child, what would be the next step that they should take? Well, if they're depressed, treat them, see that, see that they get treatment themselves. And, and if that doesn't help, to uh, go see a clinician and get an evaluation. And there are some good behavioral treatments for that. So, so these types of phobias or anxieties should be taken seriously by the parents and, and they should seek help for their, for their child. I think so. If, you know, if a woman is depressed, and I'm sure it's true for fathers too, we just can't say with research, and, and she's having a clinical depression that uh, needs treatment, the first thing she'd do is get herself treatment. And make sure if one treatment doesn't work to try another treatment but to get into remission. And if that doesn't help, and a child is having phobias, to get help for the child. Now, there, we have some new data that we're just working on that shows that when a woman is feeling better, the depression is remitting, that her parenting changes. And as in, one, in our study that is, is really new, the mother says, I can now talk and listen to my child. And we hear the children saying, my mother is more affectionate. So depression is a, is a very damaging disorder to interpersonal relationships. And a lot of times, just good treatment to remission will revert some of these symptoms and help the child. Well, um, a number of questions we receive, I'm sort of summarizing them, asks about um, sort of what you just alluded to, the, the relationship um, between the effects of the depression that the mother has on the mother, that those effects on her parenting abilities. She may be a great parent when she's not depressed, but not as good of a parent because of her depression. And so there's that effect on the child versus the inherent more physical, inherited genetic kind of effects. Can you comment on sort of the relationship between those things and the, the child's potentially developing a depression? Well, that is the, the ultimate question, and that's how I began. Is it inherited? Right. But we all have vulnerabilities. You know, some of us are vulnerable to hypertension, to diabetes, uh, to obesity. And these things are, you know, the tendency is likely inherited. And probably depression is the same way. But there's lots of things that can be done in the environment that can prevent the person going into a full episode, or, and, and at least delaying the onset as much as possible. Therefore, uh, whether it's inherited or whether it's environment, 
um, getting rid of those symptoms are very important. And our new research seems to suggest that when the symptoms are resolved, the parenting uh, improves and the child improves. So I would urge, it's very hard to get depressed mothers into treatment because they're more concerned about their children than they are about themselves. And, uh, and we have found that and other groups have found it. Uh, they're more willing to bring their child for treatment than to get help themselves. And I would urge them, a woman who's depressed, to get treatment and to give herself the sick role. You know, she has an illness that is making life very difficult for her. And if she gets better, she'll, go, she'll be like herself. And she should give herself the time and uh, the inclination to get treatment. Usually that helps the parenting. Right, right. That, that for them to realize that by helping themselves, not only are they helping themselves, they're also helping their child in That's a very clear-cut way. Should be generous about helping themselves. Exactly. And they're often more generous about helping their children. Yep. See, we had trouble recruiting depressed mothers into this study. Now we had there's no trouble seeing uh, depressed women in the childbearing ages. They come for treatment. But if the depressed woman has children, they don't come on the average because they're taking care of the children. And this is a place where you really should be good to yourself. Good point. Very good point. And how um, the issue of postpartum depression, how does that fit into what we're talking about? Um, we did not include. Uh, we did not study postpartum depression because we only studied the children from ages six on. So the women were uh, way beyond having a postpartum depression. Some of them may have had postpartum depression, but not enough to, to make a separate statement. However, uh, there are clinics now that are paying much more attention to depression in the peripartum and also the postpartum period in women. And that's a critical issue because, uh, you know, how do you treat the depression? Depression is not good for the fetus, and medication, it's not clear whether, what the impact is. That's research we're doing right now at Columbia. Okay. I've received a couple of questions that I think are interesting in terms of um, other psychiatric conditions than depression that the mother may have and the impact on the child, whether it be bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders. Um, what, can, what can you say with regards to those other conditions and um, the importance of the mother getting treatment for that with regards to her children? Well, we haven't studied that intensively, but other people have. It's very interesting, the children of schizophrenic parents are often taken care of by other people. So uh, the impact uh, on a daily basis may not be quite as, uh, as great as you see in depression. As far as anxiety, well, a, a large number of our patients have depression and anxiety disorders. And that in, if they had depression and anxiety, we see more anxiety in the, kid, in the children. Uh, and it depends what the anxiety is, but particularly if it's panic disorder, we see much more of that. And it's frankly harder to treat someone who has depression and anxiety disorder. They take longer to treat and um, they don't do as well. Hopefully our personalized treatment will be able to answer those questions uh, better and have more personalized medication or psychotherapy of some combination. As far as bipolar disorder, uh, I think the offspring have more problems that are in affect regulation. And uh, that's been studied, but to a lesser extent. Um, I have a, a question here that I'm sure a number of people listening um, would ask, um, which is, a question from a, um, a, a young mother saying, while I 
get treated for my own depression? Should my child have some kind of preemptive counseling or treatment? Ooh. <laughs> How old is the child? Well, that I don't know. Well, okay. Why don't you give us an answer based upon a couple of different potential ages? Because I have a feeling more than one person would be asking this question. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, you don't want to um, make it inevitable for children or scare them. I think an adolescent, though, who's growing up, has grown up with a depressed mother, um, may be educated about the depression, especially if it runs in families and it's very strong, as to what are the early symptoms and what are some of the things one can avoid in order to uh, prevent depression. Now, one of those, of course, is uh, disruptions of attachments. Uh, that's a hard thing to tell an adolescent. You know, don't choose a boyfriend who's going to dump you. Uh, right. uh, choose, choose your girlfriends as uh, for people who will be stable and supportive and won't bully you. I don't know how you deal with that. It's, that's right. Very... Well, as a parent of, uh, of, of adolescents, it certainly I don't know how much power we have over who they choose, much less, um, you know, get them to, you know. It, it's... But, you know, we could, we can uh, normalize it. So mm -hmm. that, um, you know, some children or some adolescents, if, they're, um, if the boyfriend dumps them, will say, uh, oh, he wasn't any good anyway, and uh, good riddance. Whereas others will say, you know, it's something, some terrible blow to my self-esteem, and there's something wrong with me, and life is not worth living. So, uh, and the difference may be whether one has a vulnerability to depression, whether one gets angry or one just blames oneself. And for those, for, for a child who, an adolescent who uh, has that, the view that uh, maybe it's their fault and there's something wrong with them, some education about that and normalizing it might be helpful. And so they may be useful for them to talk to somebody. Okay. Um, we have another question sort of asking about um, the, the uh, factors that might potentially brought on the depression in the mother. So the question is, if depression is brought on by a death in the family or something in the environment, um, how does this affect um, the, the situation that we're discussing in terms of the kids? Well, everybody has things in their life. They have death, loss, separation transitions, disputes, but not everybody gets depressed. And it's true that if there's a buildup of loss of attachments, uh, multiple losses of, of close relationships, that have, most people are vulnerable to depression. Uh, but I think, and depression really comes out of the blue. I think that um, doing psychotherapy, one looks to that event a trigger of the depression because it's a way of helping the person to get over it if one is using a psychotherapy approach. Uh, I don't think that matters much for the child as to whether mom's depression was brought on by a grief or a transition or a dispute. It's depression is depression. Okay. Um. I have a question from a person who it, it appears is receiving treatment um, but uh, is not yet better. And the question is, what can one do when uh, medication is not helping treatment-resistant depression? Well, first of all, you have to give it a chance. And secondly, uh, you have to, they have to make sure that if it's medication, the dose is uh, is correct, that it's a high enough dose. And uh, symptoms don't improve immediately. As anyone who's been depressed knows that even with the best medication, it takes several weeks before there's a, a response. Uh, and one should be with a physician who's open-minded, uh, but gives a good trial of the treatment. 
And if it doesn't work, that they either change the medication, up the dose, add psychotherapy. There are many good treatments, and that's why we're trying to study personalized treatment, because there are many good treatments for depression, but we don't know which one will work for a particular patient. But one shouldn't get stuck on any one of them. But you have to give it a chance. In terms of the study of the personalized treatment, um, what type of factors will you be looking at? Give us a little bit more detail about how that study um, will, will pan out. Right. Well, first let me say that for those who have seen the, the numbers on the webinar, that the uh, Dallas number is incorrect. It's, we gave the Boston number twice, and we will correct that for Dallas. Yes. Um, and put it, uh, put it on. Uh, what we're doing is patients are getting a standard treatment, an SSRI, uh, that's widely used, and we know that it's efficacious. And they're also getting, uh, or they're randomly assigned to receive that or placebo. And before they receive the treatment, we're doing uh, brain imaging studies, MRI, structural and functional imaging studies. We are doing EEG studies. and we are doing neuropsych testing and also do a, a detailed clinical assessment. And we're collecting blood for uh, genetic studies. What we hope is to develop a, a, uh, a score, a battery, a test that will give us a score that might best predict who is going to be a responder to this particular medication or a non-responder. And there are other studies going on that are doing this. Uh, in somewhat different way so that we will be able to compare some of our results. But we're using a number of different biomarkers and to see if any of those will help us make predictions. People are asking, are you aware of any um, similar type of studies uh, for other conditions, such as bipolar or schizophrenia, et cetera? Yeah, there's one that's just started at NYU. I read about in the New York Times for PTSD. And um, there are studies like this for Alzheimer's. And for bipolar or schizophrenia, I'm not sure. I'm sure if you go on the web or Google it, you'll find, find them. Okay. There are about three studies for depression now that are going on. Okay. We have a question asking about um, the role of peer counselors. Um, and I'm curious if that's something that uh, either from a research standpoint or a clinical standpoint um, you can speak toward. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to what I know related. Uh, peer counselors have, you know, that's a, that needs a definition. I'm not sure exactly what is meant by the uh, uh, the person who questioned, raised the question by a peer counselor. But if you mean uh, lay, uh, lay people who learn how to do counseling, uh, then I can answer a little bit. There is uh, many different movements now to try to find ways of offering psychological support within the healthcare system. And support that will be uh, efficient and economical and acceptable. And frankly, it's being done more in developing countries than in the United States, although there is, cons there is starting to be an interest in the United States. Many people who come into particularly primary care clinics have symptoms of depression. And it's usually a transient episode that um, requires some evaluation and some support. Some people, of course, have serious depressions and they need uh, psychiatric treatment. So there is somewhat of a beginning movement to train uh, health workers, I'm not sure if that's the same as what you mean by peer counselors, to train health workers to evaluate, support, figure out what's going on in a person's life, and then triaging them into um, the few that need mental health treatment, into mental health treatment, and offering support for the others. And that's going on now, and I think it's going to be an increasing movement, because 
psychotherapy in general has been decreasing in the United States in duration, in payment, and in use. And yet psychotherapy and psychological approaches are very important in these treatments. So is there a way of providing this that is evidence-based and that we know um, is useful? Good. Thank you. Um, we have, I think, a very good question concerning um, the issue of untreated depression or anxiety and the potential that that could lead to self-medication and substance abuse in adolescents and uh, young adults. Uh, well, there's no question that untreated depression, well, a lot of depressions respond spontaneously. You know, the, the situation, the trigger resolves itself and uh, the adolescent doesn't flunk out of school or the boyfriend comes back or uh, uh, they do well in, in, uh, on, on the test and those, and, and those triggers, uh, they, they lead to a, a, they have a positive outcome and the person is uh, feeling better. But untreated depression that goes on and continues with symptoms is a very downward course and, uh, and can lead to self-medication. We studied a group of people at a primary care clinic and we assessed them for a whole range of illnesses, including depression. And then four years later, we went back and we saw who was treated and who wasn't treated. And the people who received no treatment for depression uh, were more apt to end up in the hospital and more apt to end up using emergency rooms for their treatment, for their mental health treatment. Now, this was an older population, and we didn't see much uh, drug abuse. But I think in adolescents, we might. The, um, this is, the technology is amazing. A couple of people are, are giving feedback in terms of the, the peer counseling um, question and um, saying that it, it's basically somebody who has experienced a similar um, diagnosis um, and then um, may have some training in terms of helping other people. That's the type of peer counseling. Oh, okay. I, I don't have as much experience with that, but I think it's probably a pretty good idea as long as they have some training. You know, and that what and if and there's some control that what is being done is helpful and not unhelpful. Uh, one thing that troubles me, and that's probably because I'm a parent, is um, this counseling that would be peer counseling that would uh, try to separate an adolescent from the family rather than help the adolescent to resolve some of the differences within the family because the family is the basic social support. Now, family can be very extended, but uh, a counseling that would lead to premature independence before an adolescent can handle it, uh, I, I think can be destructive. We see some of these kids that are homeless, and uh, they need social support. So, I think then it's a good idea, but it needs to have some training and some monitoring. Okay. And we have a question asking for a little bit more information. And I love that it's so interactive that people sort of follow up to, to your points um, about the phobias. And they're um, asking to give a little more detail about the common types of phobias that might be seen in, in a child. Mm, well, phobias are very common in children. Uh, you know, fear of fear of animals, fear of insects, fear of going out, social anxiety, um, generalized anxiety, uh, not wanting to go to school. Um, so, if uh, that, if a parent, parents were to see that in a child, um, in the context of the mother having a history of depression, that would sort of raise a, 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 a blinking yellow light. That would raise a blinking yellow light. If it went on, you know, the first time they say, I'm afraid of 
a dog said, I won't go out because it's a dog, um, I wouldn't rush to the doctor. But if that continues and it results in impairment, then I would get help. Um, in, our, in our remaining moments, um, Myrna, I want to ask if you can just sort of give a couple of key take-home points um, to the people who are, who are listening to us right now. Oh, sure. I'd like to do that. The first is that if you are a depressed parent, you're a depressed person, take care of yourself and get help. And if the first help doesn't work, uh, if you've given it a chance, then try something else because there are many different ways of getting help. There are many different treatments, but it's always it's not always easy to tell which will work for which patient. The other is that if you have a child who is having symptoms uh, and you have depression yourself, make sure you take care of yourself first because that might be the best thing you can do for a child. And, the, and finally, if you are from a family that depression is uh, running through it and your adolescent starts having symptoms, get them help because you might be able to prevent some of the sequelae of depression, which is problems in school, problems in heterosexual or homosexual choices. Um, it can mess up your life. A child can maybe not live up to what their capacity is. If you get help early, you might be able to prevent all of that. Well, those are extremely important points. Um, and just the focus on getting help. At the close of each Healthy Minds episode, I make what I think is an important point, which is with help, there's hope. And people shouldn't suffer in silence. They should get, get help so that they could get treatment. Um, so I think it's an important message. Myrna, this has been just an outstanding presentation. Um, I know just based on the questions and the response, our audience has really been very engaged by it. And I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank um, you. Yes. And I just want to remind our audience that the webinar has been recorded. So um, if you've missed any portion of it, you can go back and see it again. And if you have uh, friends, colleagues, family members who you'd like to have the opportunity to hear and see the webinar, um, they can see that as well. I want to let people know that our next webinar will be Tuesday, March 12th, and Dr. Daniel Weinberger, um, a Foundation Scientific Council member and director and CEO of the Lieber Institute for Brain Development, will present on research discoveries in schizophrenia. Um, and we're looking forward to, to that and subsequent uh, webinars. And with that, I want to again um, thank Dr. Weissman and also thank our audience for joining us. Let me wish everybody a, a good day. And I'm looking forward to having people back uh, for our uh, subsequent webinars. Take care, everybody. <laughs>